Okay, good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here with us tonight. My name is Callan Steinman. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's program, the 2024 um, um, Lecture for Art and Poetry. This program is made possible by the generous support of Kathy Prescott and Grady Thrasher, whose endowment of the Airily Strange Fund for Art and Poetry um, um, allows us to bring a distinguished speaker to campus each year and funds an annual youth art and poetry program for middle and high school students here in athens Clark County. The Airily Strange Lecture and Youth Arts Programming honor the life and work of Airily Strange. Um, and she was a poet, playwright, filmmaker, and founder of the popular Athens monthly open poetry, poetry forum called Word of Mouth. Airily passed away in 2013, and I thought I'd share a few words from her um, um, obituary to give a sense of the kind of person that she was. This is how she was descri described. Combining fierce devotion with gentleness of spirit, she championed the underdog, the underserved, and the underappreciated, while giving short shrift to the self-righteous, the imperious, and the prejudiced. But most of all, through her poetry and that of others, she sought truth in all its hiding places. And her works are often visceral responses to her keen observations of the inconsistency, injustice, as well as the striking beauty and love associated with the human experience. I never had the chance to meet um, 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 Ara Lee, but she sounds like my kind of person, and, and we're proud to honor um, um, her legacy here at the museum. So once again, I'd also I'd like to, to extend our serious gratitude to Kathy and Grady for their continued support of these programs and of the museum. And I'd also like to thank our collaborators in the Department of Language and Literacy Education, Kevin Burke, Ruth Harmon, Jim Garrett, their grad students and colleagues who continue to be fantastic partners to us in our work with this lecture series and our youth programs. So I'm gonna hand it over to Jim now who will introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you so much, Callan, and to the uh, lecture committee for inviting Dr. Karen Sandloss here tonight and for allowing me to in introduce her. Um, Dr. Karen Sandloss is Associate Professor of Art and Education at the University of Illinois at Chicago and the founding director of the BFA in Art Education, a program that prepares students to become K-12 art teachers in Chicago public schools. Sandlas's research explores the role of interiority in educational and aesthetic experience and on the pedagogical work of dream life in the classroom and public sphere. She's currently a co-PI on the Presidential Initiatives Grant, Cripping the Arts, Expanding the Impact of the Arts and Humanities. She's also a psychotherapist in training with the Chicago Institute for Psychoanalysis and maintains a small clinical practice. Also though, um, Karen is a treasured collaborator and a dear friend of mine. I, I have a deep admiration for your work, Karen, uh, and everyone, you all get to know a little bit about where that admiration comes from. I just want to share a couple of things of what I find so generative in her work before I invite her up to give her lecture. We all know of the tight spaces we find ourselves in, in educational context, the dramas, dilemmas, conflicts, ambivalences are not in short supply. And Dr. Sandloss has an amazing skill to work from within the confines of these extraordinarily tight spaces. And in so doing, loosen some of those strictures to help us find ways to move in new and creative ways, though without offering directives or prescriptions. So in her work, and what I, what I find so, so helpful is rather than offering us how-to guides for how to engage with difficulty in classrooms, she instead lingers on the more disturbing realities that such a guide does not exist and helps us to consider what that realization might mean for us as teachers and learners. Hers is instead an invitation to us, as she has written, to quote, extend the perceptual capacities of the self, rather than cultivate more opportunities to decide in advance what will or will not be done with students in classrooms. I'm so excited uh, to learn from you this evening, Karen, and I'm excited, incredibly honored to introduce to you all my friend, Dr. Karen Samos. Well, I'll begin by extending thanks to my hosts 
for inviting me to give the 2024 annual lecture in honor of Airlie Strange. I'm delighted to be here. I'm also very grateful for the opportunity to get to know Airly Strange and her writing a little bit. In a tribute written to Airly Strange after her death, the journalist Kathy Wilson makes the following observations. Airly was always writing in her head and she'd figured out how to be alone together. These descriptions orient my thinking about the vital role that art plays in helping us build internal worlds, and also about the kinds of conditions that foster creativity and learning. For the mind to thrive and develop in a creative way, one has to be able to shut out the world while, paradoxically, staying connected to it. So I want to start by talking a little bit about learning loss. In the US, amidst the catastrophic losses of the COVID-19 pandemic, a national conversation about learning loss is concerned with how best to help students catch up on the time they missed in school. The shift to remote teaching and back to in-person instruction and back and forth has reinvigorated educational debates about the most efficient and engaging ways for teachers to teach what students need to learn. At the same time, educators are asked to be responsive to new and more challenging forms of student anxiety, disconnection, and disengagement. This too is a loss, one that can't be overcome by new and innovative ways of delivering the curriculum. We are all learning how to re-engage with learning when learning loss is understood as a problem to be fixed, this gives educators and policymakers a clear course of action, as well as a place to direct resources. To accelerate the learning process, over the past few years, US school districts have dedicated over $190 billion in federal funds to tutoring programs, additional support staff, and summer school. And a lot of that money actually never got spent. But while compensatory measures are arguably warranted under unprecedented pandemic circumstances, critics point out how learning loss is being used to justify an already existing policy agenda for public education. Kathy Kareff, in a 2021 blog post for the Chicago Teachers Union entitled, Was This Really a Lost Year?, argues that Quote, the vague notion of learning loss is being used to justify more testing mandates and profits for testing companies. End quote. The mathematician John Ewing, a, critics of, a critic of high stakes testing, questions the scientific basis of calculating learning loss, uh, calculating learning instrumentally in terms of loss or gain. Ewing writes, Learning loss is usually illustrated by the summer break. We are told that students experience about three months of loss each summer. What's this mean? If a student does more poorly on a test in September than in May, is learning really lost? It seems doubtful or at least incomplete. Mathematicians know that stepping away from a topic for a while requires time to recollect the bits and pieces when you return. Those bits and pieces aren't lost. They only require reassembling. And often the reassembling leads to greater understanding. Similar things occur in every subject and in other areas of life as well, like riding a bike or playing the piano. So Ewing points out that even in more ordinary pre-pandemic times, learning does not proceed in a linear predictable fashion, and students are not empty vessels waiting to be filled up with knowledge. For Ewing, learning involves recollecting and reassembling the bits and pieces in ways that expand and deepen understanding as we re-engage the material. This description brings to mind the creative practices of artists who learn, often through trial and error, to suspend certainty over knowledge, to immerse themselves in a process over time, and to use materials as the means to explore ideas in an open-ended way, wherever that exploration may lead them. 
My impulse to want to reconceptualize learning loss is on one level a response to a national conversation and also on a more intimate level an attempt to understand my own experiences of the past several, several years during which I stayed home for long stretches of time and like many of you taught my classes remotely and met with students and colleagues online. Upon returning to in-person work and teaching, I felt many things. I was aware that I still had an undergraduate program to run, classes to teach, and students to mentor. Everything looked the same. The buildings, the classrooms, the furniture, and so on. But I had changed. I was a little older, to be sure, but I also felt humbled and uncertain about being in person once again. The next few images I'm going to show you are were taken in 2021 um, during the semester when we all went back to in-person learning and these are some images of student teachers working with students on art projects in, in Chicago public schools and you can see we're still right in the midst of the pandemic with mask wearing and all of that. So upon returning to campus and in-person teaching, there was no plan for getting caught up or making up for lost time. We all just had to find our way. And finding our way meant encountering experiences of loss, both ordinary and extraordinary, on a daily basis. On campus, there was a renewed focus on student mental health and the need for expanded support services. Students had lost family members, they had missed out on their high school graduations. They hadn't spent time hanging out with their friends. Some losses were easier to point towards and to name, while others were less tangible and harder to locate. All of this got me thinking about relationships among learning loss and creativity. Students absolutely need mental health supports. But educators also need creative and enlivening ways to think about learning experience as an emotional situation and a space of relation with others. So instead of instrumentalizing learning loss as a problem in need of a fix, I started to wonder what would it mean to hold the fix in abeyance? What sorts of complexity, both emotional and conceptual, would this open up? The writer Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, in her slim 2021 memoir, Notes on Grief, offers a poignant example of what it can feel like to be immersed in loss, just trying to make sense of the experience and find a way forward. Writing about the initial days and weeks following the sudden death of her beloved father, Adichie situates the reader in the midst of her process of grieving him. She writes, I am afraid of going to bed and waking up, afraid of tomorrow and all the tomorrows after. I am filled with disbelieving astonishment that the mailman comes as usual and that people are inviting me to speak somewhere and that regular news alerts appear on my phone screen. How is it that the world keeps going, breathing in and out unchanged, while in my soul there is a permanent scattering? Adichie in this passage evokes the agonizing reality her father's death has forced her to contend with. This loss, abrupt and irreversible, is profoundly disorienting. Worth noticing here is Adichie's description of her internal reality as in pieces, at odds with the once familiar and predictable routines and rhythms of the world around her, at odds with her own past certainties about how people move through grief, through stages, and you know, uh, with, an, with an ultimate endpoint that one reaches. Only now do I learn, she writes in the memoir, that there is no way through. I am at the center of this churning. So the loss here is twofold. Adichie has lost her father, and she has also lost the person she once was in relation to him. One place where people often bring their losses is clinical therapy. 
In contemporary versions of therapy, responses to loss and mourning privilege what we call solution-focused approaches, including short-term therapy and antidepressant medication. As the psychoanalyst Darian Leader points out in his 2008 book, The New Black, Mourning, Melancholia, and Depression, he writes, mourning is equated with getting over a loss rather than with understanding how experiences of loss shape our lives, often in ways that escape our immediate awareness. Leader continues. The cliche that losses need to be worked through so that we can move beyond them suggests that mourning is something that can be done and dusted. We are encouraged so often to get over a loss, yet bereaved people and those who have experienced tragic losses know full well that it is less a question of getting over a loss and on with life than finding a way to make that loss a part of one's life. Living with loss is what matters. And writers and artists show, it, show us the many different ways in which this can be done. So Leader's description of the work of mourning turns our attention to the human capacity for creative agency in transforming the pain of loss into a relation of meaning. When we mourn a loss, Leader argues, it isn't just our thoughts about the lost loved one that count, but what we do with them, how they are organized, arranged, run through, altered. In mourning, a process that leader refers to as thinking through loss, two moves are necessary, one external and one internal. First, we have to realize that life still has something to offer. This is the external move. And second, the absence must be registered internally, or as leader puts it, inscribed indelibly into our mental lives. What we do in mourning involves a particular kind of learning. We learn to symbolize what is no longer there. The object becomes a new internal object in absentia. This process of internalization is not straightforward, but it is generative. If all goes well, a new psychological relation, a new thought, a new way of thinking, can emerge. For clues about how this process works in the mind, we can look to the creative strategies and modes of expression we find in art and aesthetic experience. By way of example, I want to turn now to Chicago-based visual artist Nick Cave. And some of you may know Nick Cave's work because one of his pieces is up at the gallery here on campus. In, the short, uh, in a short documentary for Art 21, Cave talks about how he got started on his biggest and most sustained project to date, his sound suit project. And this is the story he tells. The year was 1992, and Nick Cave was sitting alone on a park bench, his thoughts focused on a recent shocking event, the recent savage beating of an African-American man named Rodney King by a group of police officers in Los Angeles and the protests that followed. This was a time before cell phones, but the incident had been documented on a camcorder by a man named George Holliday and broadcast widely. So sitting on that park bench, eyes downcast, Nick Cave asked himself this question, what does it feel like to be discarded, profiled, dismissed? He recalls, there was this twig on the ground, and I looked at that twig as something discarded. And then I proceeded to just start collecting the twigs in the park. And then I brought them all back to the studio, and I started to build this sculpture. Cave, <clears throat> Cave an artist whose work combines sculpture, fashion design, and performance, noticed the sound that the twigs made when he put on the suit and began walking around. For Cave, this was the moment the significance of this work emerged. I was building this suit of armor, he realized, something that I could shield myself against the world and society. Over three decades later, 
Nick Cave's Sound Suit series comprises over 50 wearable sculptures and has exhibited, uh, exhibited internationally in galleries and public performances. And what really strikes me about the story that Nick Cave tells about how he got started with the Sound Suit project is he was just collecting materials, assembling things, creating these suits, and it wasn't until he heard, put on the suit, wore it, and walked around and heard the sound that he understood what he was making. So there's this capacity to, to suspend knowing, to suspend understanding, and just stay with the process that feels significant to me. <clears throat> Nick Cave sound suits are monumental in stature and quite spectacular to behold. They're made from a wide range of materials, from twigs to beads, from fabric to fur, and from buttons to sequences. Cave chooses his materials intuitively, often while wandering around flea markets and antique shops. I don't have a list, he remarks, Instead, the artist allows his mind and eye to wander, identifying an object that will become the instigator, as he puts it, something that might spark a new direction for the next sound suit. Visually, the suits resist easy categorization. They could be monsters or aliens or hybrid creatures, both human and animal. At once other and playful, the sound suits invite the viewer to imagine alternative scenarios, selves, and even worlds. The image you're looking at right now is a sample, an example that a student teacher created in 2021 when we were all going back to in-person teaching of how to design a sound suit. And the student teacher did this because this was a project they wanted to do with their students in a high school art classroom. And this was art one, so lots of students were very new to art making. So the student teacher, Alex O'Neill, gave the students this prompt. What is something that you need protection from? And once the students thought about that and were able to identify something, then the student teacher got them thinking about materials and design elements and principles and how they would put together a plan for a sound suit that would protect them from the very thing that they think they need protecting from. So in this example, Alex wrote, this sound suit protects me from multiple things. The top half is soft and comfortable, giving me a safe place to escape to when feeling anxious. The bottom half is reminiscent of a handmade quilt that takes the form of a skirt. I will not care about gender expectations and I will relish in individuality. And lastly, I would wear this suit when existing near judgmental people. Letting the suit become the topic of conversation rather than hearing comments about myself. Um, I had the privilege of being able to observe the students doing a critique of their sound suit designs in class and going up one by one and showing off their designs. Um, and this was one of the most engaged Chicago Public Schools classrooms I'd ever seen. So um, I think there's a way in which using an artist like Nick Cave's work as a starting point, students can think quite deeply about how they want to represent aspects of their internal world in forms of communication to the people around them. <clears throat> so what can we say about Nick Cave's artistic method as a work of mourning? For the artist, there is a process of noticing objects, the twigs on the ground, collecting materials, assembling things in relation to other things, and so on. And this is not unlike what we sometimes do when we go through the process of mourning a lost loved one. We go through stuff. In the making process and in the artwork itself, there is an ambiguity, an interplay between what is real and what is imaginary. This ambiguity is crucial both to art making and to the mourning process, an effect of what Leader calls the play between internalization and externalization. 
According to Leader, symbolizing a loss is a necessary part of being able to start thinking about it. If things go well, not only is the loss registered or inscribed internally, it's also transformed by the mourner into a message to be conveyed to someone else, a therapist, an audience, a family member, or a community. This space of ambiguity, of play between internal and external reality, appears also in Adichie's notes on grief. Toward the end of the memoir, in note 29 of 30 notes in total, there is an anecdote that Adichie writes about that feels out of sync emotionally with the rest of the writing in the memoir. There's a sense of unreality. It feels almost dreamlike. Idichi describes a scene in which she has found her way to a website where people can go and create custom t-shirt designs. And she starts creating custom t-shirt designs in memory of her father. We don't know how we will grieve until we grieve, Idichi writes. She goes on to say that she's not particularly fond of t-shirts. She doesn't really wear them. Although she does care about fashion, she doesn't care about t-shirts. Nevertheless, she spends many solitary hours making these memorial t-shirt designs, trying out fonts and colors and images, inscribing the t-shirts with her father's initials, and various slogans in Igbo, the native language she learned from her father and shared with him. We don't know from the memoir if any of these t-shirt designs ever actually got made. I suspect not. I think this would be besides the point. Worth noticing here is the process the writer is engaged in. She's experimenting, trying out possibilities, and we can think of the activity of designing t-shirts as a symbolic gesture, a way of inscribing internally an identification with a father who no longer exists in the world. It is a visual process over which Adichie, a gifted writer, presumably has a little less mastery. The visual method is significant in my view because the writer doesn't know the way forward. She has to find her way, perhaps using an unfamiliar method. In the memoir, Adichie wonders what her father would think of the various t-shirt designs. She pictures him observing her and she pictures his amusement. And then she writes, I finally understand why people get tattoos of those they have lost. The need to proclaim not merely the loss, but the love, the continuity. I am my father's daughter. It is an act of resistance and refusal, grief telling you it is over and your heart saying it is not. Grief trying to shrink your love to the past and your heart saying it is present. This passage highlights a shift in the memoir with Adichie's, within Adichie's orientation toward the loss of her father from grief to mourning. According to Leader, whereas grief is defined as the emotional reaction to a loss, mourning is a kind of psychical work. The transformation of grief into mourning is not a linear process, and mourning is not a quick fix. The process is difficult and painful, it takes a long time, and it is fraught with resistance. However, in this passage, from the ruins of a writer's grief, we can sense the emergence of something creative. Symbolization has the power to get things moving again. It is both a gesture of mark making and a psychological achievement. Adichie can name her loss, or what Leader refers to as naming the absence, in a way that doesn't devastate or overwhelm her. To put it succinctly, Adichie's symbolic gesture can contain this thought, the loved one is gone, but the love is not. And with this comes the realization that she can learn to live not just with an absence, but with an enduring presence. Thus far, I have been talking about the creative potential of loss and mourning through two examples, one a writer and the other a visual artist. Across these examples and others, I'm looking for different ways in which artists and writers show us how mourning can be done. There is no one way, there are many ways. I'm also interested in how artists and artworks create conditions in which the rest of us, audiences, might face and experience the reality of loss. 
whether the loss is intimate and personal or collective and shared, as in the case of artists whose work provokes us to consider the losses of climate change or histories of racism and colonization. A feature of art, in my view, is that it asks us to think and feel without telling us what to think and feel. Education often does the opposite. It asks us to take in knowledge and then externalize it on an achievement test. Works of art engage us differently in a process closer to what the psychoanalyst and artist Meg Harris Williams referred to as thinking with a work of art as opposed to thinking or speaking about it. For Meg Harris Williams, thinking with a work of art involves the play of internalization and externalization, but not for the purposes of mastering knowledge or deploying information. As Harris Williams points out, not only do artists and writers create works of art in and of themselves, they also create processes that exemplify the process of symbol formation. So there's a kind of modeling that this artist and psychoanalyst was interested in. Initially, our encounters with art can lead us into what Harris Williams calls a cloud of unknowing, a space of illegibility emanating from the artwork. In this space, art can nudge us to ask questions and make meaning without giving us answers or affirmation or telling us what to do. Art can open up absences and emptiness with no guarantees that the gaps will be filled in. If we can tolerate the unknowing, we might begin to identify with the artist's aesthetic choices and decisions. We might begin to notice their attention to form, the kinds of questions they must have been asking, their ways of thinking about questions with and through materials, and so on. This process, in turn, gives us access to our own insides in a more sustained and fluid way. What I'm trying to say is that art can't tell us what to do with our feelings of grief and loss or teach us how to mourn. In learning, as with loss, there are no predictable stages to move through. What art can do is take us into symbolic spaces, spaces in which we might, as Harris Williams puts it, evolve a language which is capable of containing the implications and reverberations of an emotional experience. We see this strategy at work in Adichie's memoir in the way she describes her secret forays into t-shirt design, an idiosyncratic act of symbolization and mourning situated in the midst of the memoir, in the midst of a writer writing her way through her grief. Art gives us access to new frameworks, works in progress, as the ongoing series of works in Nick Cave's Soundsuit series suggests. Thinking about the world as process is a kind of thinking we do in relation to art. We can look to the details, how the artist works with materials, how they use aesthetic strategies to frame reality for clues about how the work of mourning might work. And I, I want to turn now to a different kind of contemporary art example, one that centers experiences of loss as creative material in a collaborative way. The title of this work is Walk With Me While I Remember You, and it had its world premiere in November 2023 at the Evergreen Brickworks, a cultural space in the midst of a forest preserve in Toronto, Canada. As the title suggests, this piece takes participants on a meandering walk through nature. As we walk, we are immersed in one-on-one -on -one listening sessions with young performers who share stories they've written about a significant loss that they've recently experienced, of a parent most commonly. A central theme of this performance piece, Carry the Fire, is symbolized in the form of a flame-shaped pin that participants were asked to wear in our coats during the performance. The pin performed a symbolic function, but also a practical one. It enabled the performers to identify us, the participants whom they approached with the invitation, will you walk with me? 
Walk With Me While I Remember You is the latest offering from the Youth Driven Arts Organization, Mammalian Diving Reflex, or MDR. They're based out of Toronto. For over 30 years now, MDR has been staging performances that upend conventional thinking about what young people can do or what they can handle. An early example of this approach is the performance entitled Haircuts by Children, which involved giving children lessons in how to cut hair and inviting adults to let the kids try out their new skill set by giving them a free haircut. What you see on the screen is a book about MDR's creative philosophy written by the organization's founder, Darren O'Donnell. And I really recommend this book for anyone who's interested in art education. MDR's philosophy revolves around the question, what if we put young people at the center of every decision that impacts them? And Darren's answer is, well, obviously it would upend capitalism because you know kids just can't pay attention that long. They can't stay on task all the time. They can't be productive constantly. And MDR has done performances with young people that involve getting a haircut from a, a kid who's just learned how to cut hair to um, putting children in collaboration with expert chefs making meals together and then serving them to community groups. Another performance, they branched out a little bit and worked with senior citizens and the performance was a panel discussion called All the Sex I've Ever Had. Um, so there's a way in which MDR has been uh, putting audiences off balance for about 30 years now. Um, Another interesting aspect of this group and how they work is that they built their philosophy into the structure of the organization itself. The artistic directors and administrators who run the company today are some of the kids who learned how to cut hair 30 years ago. So there was always a plan to hand off the organization to the young participants right from the beginning. MDR's playful approach to mixing up adults and kids' roles is an example of what art educator Jorge Lucero refers to as art that emphasizes relationships. Lucero writes, it is important to note that artworks that deal with relationships are unique because they're not about the self and others, rather they are the actual relationships between the self and others, presented bare for everyone to experience. Here Lucero points out that while this type of artwork is often initiated by a specific artist or arts collaborative, very quickly after the work gets started, he writes, there are many minds and hands taking up the tasks and the manifestations of that work. And um, Jorge's chapter is in this terrific edited collection, Teaching Contemporary Art with Young People, which I highly, highly recommend to anyone who's working in art teacher preparation or working with youth, doing art ed. Walk With Me While I Remember You is a good example of this many minds and hands approach that Jorge Lucero is talking about here. During the months leading up to the performance, MDR invited young people aged 14 to 19 years old who had recently experienced a loss to participate in writing workshops. The workshops were facilitated by artists but there was also a therapist in residence on hand to help the participants process their emotions and put their experience of loss into words. During the performance, on the walk itself, the one-on-one -on -one sessions were pretty tightly scripted for the most part. The young performers stayed close to their lines, the scripted performances providing a kind of frame or container to hold the experience of loss. As I listened to the stories the young people were telling, I noticed there wasn't much of a focus on the details of the person's death. Instead, the focus was on what endures, the thinking and symbolizing the young person has done to create the glow of an internal sustaining presence. A feature of the stories that the young people told was that they contained images and objects, both internal and external. And the kids' descriptions of these objects had the effect of animating and deepening the meaning of the memories that they shared. 
For example, one young woman lit a vanilla scented candle to conjure her mother's favorite scent. Another young woman, pictured here, played the piano in memory of a composition by Eric Satie that her mother was always trying to get her to learn how to play when she was younger, but her hands were too small to manage the complexity of that piece and the piano keys. Now she's old enough, she played the Eric Satie piece on an electric keyboard on the path. Another performer wrote about her memories of going bird watching with her dad and vivid, vividly described the birds that they used to see together. So I was listening to this young person talk about going bird watching and birds. She paused and suddenly she looked at me and she said, what's your favorite bird? And in that moment, I was so lost in the story she was telling, I, I couldn't answer. I struggled to find my way back, to find words. Um, this is an image of me holding a picture of me, and it's a good example of a kind of a moment in the performance where one of the kids said quite spontaneously, or so it felt, um, can I take your picture? And did so with a Polaroid camera and then gave me the photo. Uh, to take with me when I left. So I think this is another example of a, the kind of strategy that MDR uses to really situate participant, to participants in the experience of the performance. As a public performance piece, Walk With Me While I Remember You emphasizes the crucial role of the listener, the witness, the audience, in the process of transforming private grief into public acts of mourning. As Leader reminds us, mourning requires other people who may help the mourner symbolize and even access their own response to a loss. <clears throat> Toward the end of the journey, I was listening to a young person who invited me to sit down with them on a rock. And they told me about the time their dad helped them with a science project. The assignment was to do something with cardboard that would demonstrate the durability of the material. So together, father and daughter made a trampoline-like structure out of cardboard that could withstand impact. Go ahead, you can jump on it, the father said. It won't break. Here we're reminded again of the significance of continuity to the mourning process. The sentence, it won't break, symbolically transforms the lost relationship into a lasting relation. This space of relation can be evoked summoned by a young person and communicated to an audience on a walk in the woods. How do we learn from loss? What happens when we think about experiences of loss at the intersection of art and education? My thinking about these questions has taken an indirect route back to education, using concepts from the psychoanalytic clinic as tools for understanding learning as an emotional situation and a relation with others. Psychoanalytic approaches to education shift the focus away from familiar discourses of mastery over knowledge to take the side of what educator and psychoanalyst Deborah Britzman has termed the emotional situation of human incompleteness. For Britzman, incompleteness is a necessary condition of our interiority at once an obstacle to and a resource for growth and change. Incompleteness sets the stage for learning to imagine what is missing or what is unknowable. If we take seriously the idea that learning involves loss, what can we notice? Throughout this talk and by way of a few artistic examples, I've asked us to pay close attention to what it is that artists do how they use materials to make symbolic gestures, and how they symbolize through words and images a relation to what is missing or absent. In different ways, using different strategies, artists invite their audiences to enter into a process of meaning making without telling us in advance what the experience will come to mean. In doing so, artists set the stage for symbolization, a process that is at once psychological and creative. If we can notice what happens in this process, we can begin to recognize how experiences of loss show up in our classrooms as well as in our galleries 
and other cultural spaces. When I say that experiences of loss have a way of showing up in our classrooms and cultural spaces, I'm thinking not just about the times when the lesson or artwork is about loss in some way. I'm also thinking about loss as a quality of experience that shows up in educational relations, unbidden and in need of symbolization. One final brief example will help me illustrate this point. During the performance of Walk With Me While I Remember You, I recognized the experience I was having as an opportunity to be moved and inspired by the young people's stories of loss. After all, this was a work of art about loss and mourning and how young people learn to live with loss. And the timing of this premiere performance was not lost on me. This work had been in development during a global pandemic that was ongoing. So I knew what this work was about on some level, and yet as I listened and as I walked, I realized I didn't know where I was going on the walk or within myself. So when the young performer recollected times when she'd gone bird watching with her father and then asked me what my favorite bird is, it was no longer just about her loss. I was lost in thought, trying to remember if I have a favorite bird and what it would mean to me to have one. Thinking about loss and birds and storytelling reminded me of two creative projects that I was already aware of, but I was able to think about them in a new way as post-pandemic creative project, projects that center questions of how we learn to live with loss. The first is a book project entitled Disappearing Birds of North America. And this is a project in which the artist Jen Delis Reyes, working with the National Audubon Society, has identified 389 different birds that are in danger of extinction and invited 389 different artists to interpret a bird. The title of Jen's forthcoming book, Disappearing Birds of North America, is a reference to another book, The Birds of America, an early 19th century illustrated guide to birds by the naturalist and father of ornithology, John James Audubon. A former slave owner, Audubon's legacy is now under scrutiny. And a lot of these organizations, the Sierra Club, the Audubon Society, are having to um, have very complicated and difficult conversations about some of their um, founding figures. On the project website, Jan Delis Reyes writes, and I'm actually quoting from the smaller print, or we might want to take a moment to read the quote from Tempest Williams. Um, but here, Delis Reyes writes, in the original book by John's James, John James Audubon, The Birds of America, he sought to capture, catalog, and illustrate birds, many for the first time. The disappearing birds of North America takes inspiration from the original book, but this iteration is not about ownership or staking a claim. It is about protection, preservation, and communicating an urgent message of conservation. Eventually, the disappearing birds artworks will be combined in a book and each contribution will be supplemented with information on the bird's habitat, migration patterns, climate, and why and how the bird is currently at risk. And the proceeds from the book will all be dedicated to conservation work. <clears throat> in a related but distinct project that I'm gonna show you in a moment, I think is helpful in thinking about how where Wherever there is learning to live with loss, there will inevitably be resistance to learning from loss. For an example of this, we can look to a project called the English Bird Names Project. This project came out of the recent decision by the American Orth Ornithological Society to rename all of the birds within its geographical jurisdiction that are named after people. So all the eponymous bird names have to go. And this is an image from the Instagram feed of the renowned 
bird illustrator David Sibley. Um, here Sibley weighs in advocating for the project and trying to educate people about it. Sibley's Steller's Jay, pictured here, for example, is named after George Wilhelm Steller, the 18th century German botanist who's credited with discovering many species of flora and fauna in Alaska and other parts of North America. Many birds are named after renowned naturalists who are also racists and colonizers in their own time. The English Bird Names Project is therefore an attempt by the Ornithological Society to address the colonizing practices embedded within the history of bird naming. And as you might imagine, and as you can see if you're reading the comments, this project has stirred some debate within bird watching communities. Some are not willing to lose this naming convention. Others see it as an opportunity to do something creative, illuminate the ecology of the species while engaging people's hearts and minds. The new bird names will be descriptive. They will be named for the char their characteristics, sounds, habitats, and so forth. And as one commenter puts it here, down here on the right-hand side, the goal here is to enhance the odds that people might give a damn about conservation, about extinction. So this is another sense in which I think, or I'm thinking about how we learn to live with losses that feel imminent but that we might still have an opportunity to do something about. This riff on birds brings into focus how loss shapes educational experience in ways that may hinder and inhibit, but also deepen and enrich learning. When we learn from loss, we might have to give something up. We might have to give up omnipotence and mastery, tolerate absence and loneliness, or lose ourselves in another person's story only to have to find our way back out. The educational philosopher Gert Biesta, in his 2020 book called Letting Art Teach, suggests how the arts create conditions for learning to live with loss. Biesta writes, we may think of the arts as ways of sense making, as ways of coming to understandings, of the world and our place in it. This may sometimes well be the case, yet quite often the arts go in the opposite direction. Rather than clearing things up, they show us the limits of understanding. They show us that some things don't make sense or cannot be made sense of, and that we rather have to live with it. In those cases, the arts try to show us the predicament of our existence, that not everything makes sense that not everything can be resolved and urges, urge us to stay with the predicament rather than run away from it. Letting art teach us how to live with loss is not the same as looking to art to uplift us from the struggles of the world. Although sometimes uplift is helpful, it's not a place to live. Learning to live with loss is a messier process. It's more intimate and more imaginative and more grounded in reality. It takes a long time, it's unpredictable, and it doesn't look like what we've come to expect learning to look like. Getting caught up, mastering content, demonstrating what we know, and so on. In mourning, while we are able to know and to name who or what we have lost in the world, there is still the difficulty of knowing what we have lost in ourselves. Art is a vital resource for helping us stay with this predicament. This is because art moves us inward, even as, if all goes well, we are moved to re-engage with the world around us. Thank you, everyone. Questions don't even have to be fully formulated. I do want to say I really appreciate the opportunity to 
think out loud with all of you because much of what I shared with you this evening, I think has been on my mind for years throughout the pandemic. And it wasn't until I went back to in-person teaching, especially watching you know, aspiring art teachers working with high school students in that extremely difficult moment that I started to think, you know what, there's more to this conversation about learning loss than what we're talking about, you know, than, than what we maybe even have the capacity to imagine right now in the midst of this global pandemic. Um, and my hope is that when we start to think about how we learn from loss, we can think about the creativity that artists demonstrate for us all the time, but also just ordinary human creativity that we tap into in our most difficult moments. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, as in, hmm, I wonder if I do. Um, one of the reasons why I think artists are an interesting place to go with, with the question you're asking, Jim, is that artists, when, when they work in their studio or when they work in communities, oftentimes, they have a capacity to be in a process without actually knowing where the process is gonna lead. And, and I know what that takes because I do a lot of collaborations with artists and I'm often in the role of, you know, I'll be the coordinator and I'll um, make sure everyone gets paid and everyone knows what time they should show up and lunch is gonna be there and all the equipment will be there. So, you know, my job is to make sure the questions get answered and, and somehow we all know what's gonna happen. And yet, when you're collaborating with artists, the whole point is, we don't know what's gonna happen. And let's be open to that together. Um, and I can give you an example. Um, last spring, um, my, the art education program did a, had a wonderful opportunity to collaborate with an artist named Carmen Propalia, who's based out of Vancouver, Canada. And um, Carmen, is a self-described non-visual learner. Carmen is legally blind. And all of the work that Carmen does is around exploring questions of access. So, you know, for instance, looking at like, what does access mean in the space of a museum? And one of the exhibitions that Carmen did was um, a very traditional looking exhibition of, you know, what appeared to be 19th century oil paintings but they were all hung about three inches from the ground. So when you came into this exhibition, you know, the way, the way we're in the habit of orienting ourselves physically in space when we go to a visual art exhibition was completely upended by this and we had to think about that, you know. Um, so Carmen came to UIC and we brought two high school groups to do a workshop with Carmen. And in the planning stages, I said, so Carmen, what, what do you want to do with this workshop? And Carmen said, oh, you know, I like to take people on a walk. And I said, okay, tell me what that's going to look like. And Carmen said, you know, tell me about the physical space we're going to be in. And so Carmen had never been there, so I described it, you know, stairs, elevators, hallways, this and that. And then uh, he said, what, what's the outside like? And I said, what outside? <laughs> We're going outside? And he said, yeah, when you go out the front doors of the building, what, what, what do you see, what's there? And so we went through all of that. And then Carmen came, and um, we had two high school groups, um, so kids from two different high schools who'd never met each other, 
Everyone's wearing masks. We're still in the pandemic. And we didn't know how the kids were going to, I mean, were they going to be on opposite sides of the room? Would they talk to each other? What's going to happen? And um, after giving a little, a little lecture, a little overview of their work, Carmen said, okay, now we're, we're going to do something together. Can everyone stand up? And I need everyone to form a line and explain that we were going to go on a walk together. And um, there was a protocol for this that was very serious. Carmen actually spent some time explaining it to, to the students that we all needed to be in a line and everyone needed to hold on to the person in front of them. You could either hold their arm here or you could hold their shoulder, but you need to hold on. It's like tight, you know, because you're going to be relying on this person because your eyes are going to be closed. And um, the protocol also involved if the line were to break, if somebody let go or somebody, you know, um, intentionally or unintentionally, uh, there were people whose job it was to yell, break, loud enough so everyone could hear, then the line would stop, the break would be repaired, and we would continue. And in a very low-key way, Carmen explained to the students, you might think this, this experience is about you learning what it's like to be a blind person. It's actually not. You can't know what it's like to be me. I can't know what it's like to be you. This experience is about using senses that y'all don't typically rely on to move through space. We're gonna try it. So off went the line. It took about 45, what is normally about a four minute walk from you know, the room to the stairs, it took about 45 minutes. And then another maybe half an hour getting down the stairs. And I thought for sure, you know, this, this is not going to work. The kids are not going to want to do it. And what happened was I started to hear laughing and, you know, talking and um, playful, fun sounds. And I noticed that a lot of the kids had taken their masks that they were wearing because of the pandemic and put it over their eyes to make sure that they couldn't see as they had been asked to do. And... Um, so the walk took about uh, an hour and 15 minutes in total, uh, out the doors, down the street, and back. And many times, Carmen was in the lead, and many times, you know, Carmen would run into an obstacle and then have to reorient. Um, I think everyone had a really good time. I was beside myself the entire time. So I think that what, what interests me so much about what does it mean to kind of suspend knowing and let go of outcomes is you know, part of the work I do in, in, in uh, collaborating with artists and learning from time spent with artists and watching how they engage young people in ways that are nothing like what kids typically, how they spend their days in school. Does that answer your question? <clears throat> I mean, I'm curious about, I mean, this relates to your question, but maybe takes it in a slightly different direction, Jim. That moment in the encounter with art, I mean, when you go to a gallery or you go to a performance and you realize, I don't exactly know what this is about, <laughs> you know, and, and how people manage that experience in different ways. Some people go straight to the didactics, like, I gotta read because I, I need some help here. Other people have a personal policy. I never read that stuff. You know, I just want to be with the art, and you know, and some people do a bit of both. Um, but I'm interested in that moment because I do think that's the moment where we can make a lot of decisions about how to manage that not knowing moment. And what I'm really interested here in here is. Um, what does it mean to develop a practice of attending to the details? So you don't necessarily, I mean, the finished artwork is what you're working with, but that's, that's not the only thing to notice. What we can do if we can attend to the details, ask ourselves questions about materials and methods and process, is um, internalize a different kind of, of conceptual apparatus. And that's different than looking at a completed artwork and thinking about the genius artist and, and 
having an experience of amazement, which is great too. I mean, I love going to the Art Institute and looking at those masterworks. But I think there's something about contemporary art that really draws our attention to process in an interesting way. Um, and particularly now in this long pandemic moment that we're in, um, we're seeing a lot of projects that are, it makes sense, resp responding to loss in different ways, artists responding to loss. And I, I, I'm excited about projects that, are, that have loss on the radar. It's also not too late. <laughs> and there's something we can do. And I don't know yet, but I want to think about what that means. You know, what, what, what kind of agency does learning to live with loss actually give us to um, intervene? Possibly, potentially. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that was my question to you is did you know what you were doing the yeah. whole time? Yeah. No. Yeah. So was there for you a moment when oh now I the significance of this just dawned on me and I, now I understand what this is. Yeah, and I think that there's something about, uh, I mean, this is certainly the way that a psychoanalyst Meg Harris-Williams talks about it, that, you know, if you can go into the, the space of unknowing, what she calls this cloud of unknowing, you know, spend, spend some time there, let yourself be there, then, like the poet who grapples for words, you know, coming back out of that space involves a kind of grappling or struggle to say where you've been and what it's meant. And um, that's something that, I mean, if people have an opportunity to pick up this slim volume, it, it's really stunning. This is um, Ngozi Adichie's Notes on Grief. Um, and what I, what I love about the book is that, you know, the lines between when grief transitions into mourning, you know, or when, how do you tell the difference between, you know, kind of the, how stricken we are in grief often, you know, especially when a loss is set in unanticipated into doing the work of mourning does involve, I think, this process of symbolization is not the same as representation. Representation is, you know, there are different versions of it, but some versions are about um, representing things with accuracy and so on. Some are, involve artistic interpretation. 
that symbolization is really about trying to make a relationship to absence or something that is gone in the world. But it doesn't just happen that we have a kind of sustained, sometimes the relationship is too painful to allow for a sustaining relation. And that's where I think the creativity piece comes in, right? Because if you can be creative in the, in the work of symbolization, then the sustained relation can be lived with. It's bearable. It can be enlivening um, if all goes well. But I think that another direction this work has to go in is looking at what are the ways in which it doesn't go well. You know, what? because we resist loss. We don't welcome loss. There's a line in Adichie's memoir where she says something like, you know, I don't want to be changed, but I am changed. That kind of says it right there. Mm. Would happen. Or would ha either or, or wouldn't or. happen. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we've written quite a bit about <coughs> the value of risk in education and, and the move away from you know, taking risk out. And it seems like your framing, your reframing of learning loss runs along those same lines. Mm. Trying to make sense of how we can complicate the school situation to take out certainty. Because the risk is what matters. The integration of fear is what matters. Yeah. That's a great, thanks, Kevin. Yeah, that's really helpful. I mean, what you're helping me think about is that symbolization requires change. And where we often get stuck in mourning, you know, this is what Freud was talking about when he wrote about melancholia and that Darian Leader writes about that says the, the, the contemporary term is depression. You know, when we talk about depression, we're really talking about what Freud named melancholia was, a, a failure to mourn, you know, kind of an attachment to things being exactly the way they were. And so an inability to represent that absence, that gap, that space in some way is what leads to a kind of inhibition, a, a, a shutting down of creativity. So I think the fear of symbolization and the fear that it won't occur are both interesting moments, right? Because, the fee, because symbolization means you have to trust that the lost, the lost object, whatever that object is, can be internalized. It won't be lost again. It won't be lost forever, even though it is. That's the paradox, right? Um, so, yeah. And the fear that symbolization won't occur is just, I mean, that you'll just have to live with pain mm. yeah, and absence. But this book, Letting Art Teach, it's a it's a it's an interesting little biesta contribution, and it's another book I recommend if people want to think about the intersection of art and education in these kind of peculiar through these really fascinating unconventional thinkers like Art Biesta, Letting Art Teach is. Um, a good example of that, for sure. Well, thank you all for being here and just say thank you to Karen one more time if we could. Thank you so much for coming, everyone.